the transacting of business between heaven and earth. Jesus has called his disciples out down on the coast of Sisera Philippi and called them out of the kneeling multitudes and there was a great crowd there. And he's warning them about the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, false doctrines. And Jesus tells us again in the book of Timothy that in the last days seducing spirits and doctrines of devils will come after people to lead them away and to lead them astray. So he's saying beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the doctrines, the heresies, and the falsehoods of the religious crowds. And that's what they were. They were a religious crowd, far more religious than any of us. They never ate with unwashed hands. They fasted and prayed two and three times a week. They paid a tithe of everything. They kept the law. They're very religious. But Jesus said, don't get mixed up with that kind of religion. And he's saying to his disciples, don't let that kind of stuff get the upper hand of you. And my friends, we're still facing those things, all sorts of religious false doctrines and heresies of all sorts. Jesus movement, children of God movement, deeper life movements and tongue movements and all other sorts of movements are coming through the country now. And a lot of honest people are getting caught in the driftwood of that stuff. Amen. Blinding their lives and wrecking their lives and cursing their lives. Jesus said, don't get caught up in all of that religious stuff. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You don't have to run off after something else. Amen. Look for some sign. Amen. You got all you need in me. What's the need to run around hunting something else? Amen. Amen. And so as a result, my friends, we've always had a bunch of false religionists, false teachers. And he's saying then, my friends, he calls his disciples down on the coast of Sisera Philippi. He said to them, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some of them said, Thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some Jeremiah, or one of the great prophets. You notice all of them said he's John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Isaiah, one of the prophets. None of them said he's Christ the Messiah. This religious crowd didn't want him to be Jesus. He could be anybody other than Jesus Christ. He could be anybody other than the Son of God. They didn't want him to be the Messiah. The Son of God had wrecked their religions. So as a result, it's all right for him to be John the Baptist or Elias or Jeremiah or one of the prophets, it's fine. But don't let him be the Son of God. And so, my friends, we're still living in those days when we've got all that crowd. That's wanting him to be everything. They don't want him to be born of the Virgin Mary. They don't want his blood to mean anything. All sorts of sordid of things are being taught about Jesus Christ other than the real truth about him. Amen. So as a result, Jesus turns and said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Is what others are saying, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up for these disciples and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, but Jonah, flesh and blood is not revealed these unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, he's simply saying, Blessed art thou. You didn't learn this from some family tradition or some teacher. You've, got, you've had an experience from above. Amen. Because you can say that without your heart and with the truth. And it isn't something you've been taught. It isn't some traditional religion that's come down through the years. It's an experience you've had from above. And so Jesus is still saying the same thing to you and I. But whom do ye say that I, the Son of Man, am? When any crowd leaves the church, my friend, it's Christ. So as a result, we've got all of those kinds of religion. The modernists are coming up, the communists are coming up, the liberals are coming up with all of their different doctrines and theories of religion. And as a result, they were in this day. It's nothing on you, so go back in the day of Noah. Noah was the only one. He and his family that believed the real truth about God. The rest of them drowned in the flood. And today, there's always been a bunch of skeptics. And there's days when the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites laughed at God. And God sent the brimstone and fire and burned them up. 250 intellects stood out on the hillside and laughed at God and said, There's nothing to God. And God split the earth open under the feet. And they went to hell in the shirt tails before they ever knew what hit them. Amen. We've had modernists, we've had liberalists and false doctrines, teachers, and we always will have them. He said in the last days, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils will be there in great quantities, and we're in that day now. Amen. My friends, I'm conscious that we have so many heresies and so many false doctrines, but who is Jesus to you? 
Doesn't matter who he is to some modernist preacher, liberal preacher, some teacher in some institution. Who is he to you? That's what matters. My friends, Peter said, the art of Christ, the son of the living God, and he said, that's come from above. You wasn't taught that. You didn't inherit that. You didn't get that somewhere else. You had an experience from above. And he wasn't confused and mixed up about who Jesus was. Amen. And I'll tell you this morning, my friends, if you're if all of this confusion of doctrines and all of this confusion of religions confuse you, I'm afraid for you. Amen. What you need is an experience from above. And if you have that experience from above, all this other stuff won't confuse you. Amen. That's right. If in the morning the news media would blurt out across the waves of this country. Jesus Christ is a fake like Santa Claus and like Easter rabbit myths. And all the preachers have thrown their Bibles away and the churches have turned into social halls. And there'll not be any more gospel songs. There'll not be any more preaching. And all of the preachers and all of the Sunday school teachers and every religious leader in the schools of religion have closed the doors and found out Jesus Christ is a fake. And there's nothing in none of it. Wouldn't have any effect on me. Amen. Amen. Wouldn't bother me if every last preacher ever walked down on the face of this earth. The great preachers and all said this nothing. Now, I grant you, he'd hang a big question mark in my mind. You know what the question would be? Why the end of them had ever been saved tonight. Amen. My friends, after having lived a life of infidelity and wicked and violent and a God cursing, after that experience at high noon, 1932 in April, when God struck me down and Amen. saved my soul, I had an experience from above. Amen. And if the greatest preachers I've ever listened at and say there's nothing to it, I'd say, well, what he needs is salvation. Amen. And if this, all this modernist, liberalistic trends of the religions of the days confusing you, you just need one thing. Get in this altar and wait right here until you have that experience from above and that'll settle all of your confusion. I'm not confused about all of this confusions of religion. I have that experience. It's been settled forever and it stays settled. Amen. If you're confused, what you need is have an experience from above like Peter did and that will settle the whole business once and for all. Amen. Amen. After this then Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon, but Jonah, flesh and blood have not revealed it, but you've had this marvelous experience from above that makes you know that I'm the Son of God. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now what's he talking about? Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? Whom do ye say that I am? Thou art Peter. But upon this rock. What's he talking about about himself? Of course. Amen. Not about Peter. Now we've got a lot of folks that say Peter was the first foundation. That was the foundation of the church. And Jesus built the church on Peter. But that's where they're wrong. Amen. A lot of them say that Peter was the first pope. In Rome, well, the first place he's never been wrong to be in Rome. In the second place he wasn't a pope because he's disqualified. He had a wife, at least, at least I guess he did. He had a mother-in-law. He couldn't have one of those without having a wife. Amen. That disqualified him as pope. And furthermore, my friends, I want you to realize Peter never established a church. Peter never started a church. Peter never organized a church. Your church organizes the apostle Paul. Yeah. And listen to what Paul said. Paul said, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. He said, some said, we are all Paul's. We're not. We're Paul. We're not. We're Cephas. Paul said, you're a bunch of stupid carnality, every one of you. Well, you are. And Paul said, anything. Paul said, anything. Cephas said, anything. We're laborers together. One planet and another water and God give the increase wouldn't be nothing to none of us. And other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is the foundation of the church. A lot of people worry about it. You hear a lot of people say, well, I hope St. Peter lets me in the gate. What's he got to do with it? More than a barking fast dog. Amen. My beloved, my Bible tells me there's 12 gates to glory. Three on the east, three on the west, three on the north, three on the south. They're 1,500 miles apart. And the Peter tried to kick me out while I was trying to keep me out of one gate. And Simpson run in one of the other 11 and he wasn't mad. Amen. You don't stand a dog's chance keeping us out. Peter's just like everybody else. He'll go in just like you and I go in. He won't be no gatekeeper. Amen. Matter of fact, they don't keep the gates. They're never closed by day or by night. Amen. The book tells us. Don't have to have any gatekeepers. Folks that's in there don't want out. And the folks that's not in there don't want in. Amen. They don't have to have nobody keep the gates. But Jesus said, I will build my church. All right. 
He's going to build it, not Peter, not Paul, not somebody else, but he's going to build it upon what? Upon this rock himself. Amen. The eternal rock, the everlasting rock, the unshakable rock, the unquenchable rock. Amen. I will be my church. Then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Keep this one thing in mind, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't say that about anything else. He didn't say that about the home. He didn't say that about an institution. He didn't say that about the Jesus movement or the Youth for Christ movement. So he didn't say that about the fraternal orders of the civic clubs. He didn't say that about anything else. But he said, I'll build our church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's hell proofed. Amen. It's here to stay. Homes may crumble, governments may cease, institutions may fall to pieces, and clubs and fraternities may blow up, but the church will still be here when it's all blown out. Amen. He said it here to stay in hell and not whip it. He put that barrier up against it, and he spoke it, and it's been spoken, and nobody will not speak what he said. So as a result, he established his church. It's established forever. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, built it. It's his church. Now then, he said, I've given to thee the keys. What have you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What have you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, he didn't give the keys to the preacher. He didn't give them to Peter. He gave them to the church. Amen. You know the reason he didn't give the keys to preachers? I'll tell you exactly. Had he given the keys to Peter when Peter died, it had been closed up. That's right. He gave the keys to the preacher. If they died or something happened to them, heaven would be closed up. He left his church here to carry on his business till he gets back. Amen. So as a result, he didn't give the keys to some preacher. Because sometimes churches and preachers don't get along too well. Amen. And the church gets rid of the preacher. If he had the key, he'd take it with him and say, be a cold day in July when y'all did anything else. Amen. <laughs> he knew that. And then he knew it'd be wild fellas like me and Ronnie Simpson come along want to have a revival. And if the church didn't want to have one, we'd have the key. We'd unlock heaven and drink you with one. <laughs> Drown you if you put it. I've been in a few places, Brother Pastor, when it's so dead and dry you couldn't get a holy grunt. And the God knows if I'd had the key, I'd unlock him and a drink them of a revival once and for all. Amen. But I just had to draw, hide it through with them. <laughs> this church don't want to have a revival. It's not a preacher on earth that can make you have a revival. Amen. On the other hand, if you want to have a revival, you can have it. Preacher, no preacher. Amen. He gave you the keys. The keys was in your hands. And what have you bind on earth? God said, I'll work with him. Bind it up then. What have you loose on earth? I'll work with you. Loose it down here. Now then. The thing I want you to see is that Jesus established his church and gave her the keys to transact business. How can ever do it? That's the thing I want you to see this morning. What Jesus start the church? How come ever start the church? What do you want with it anyhow? Why the church? I'll tell you why. His kingdom has to be advanced. And he wanted his kingdom to go on. He wanted his business to go on. And he had to go somewhere. And do something. And so he established the church and gave her the keys to look after his business while he's gone. To illustrate what I'm trying to say, for example, if Ronnie Simpson come along here and he had some sort of a business here in America, and he'd say, first of all, here's the keys to my business. I'm going over to Europe. I want you to run my business while I get back. You occupy while I get back. I may be gone five years. I may be gone eight years. I may be gone ten years. But here's the keys to my business place. You run this till I get back. Here's the keys. Operate it till I get back. I'm going over and you're to start another business. And when I get it going, good, I'll be back. But you look at my business. He hands me the keys and makes his trip into Europe. And I feel obligated to his business the rest of my time here till he gets back. Now that's what Jesus is doing. He's fixing to go somewhere and do something else. And he didn't want his business to go uh, lacking. So he established the church and gave her the keys and said, You look after my business till I get back and I'll see through the hell. Don't stop you. Amen. Amen. Well, where's he going? Well, I'll tell you where he's going. He's going to fix me and you a place to go to. Amen. We didn't have nowhere to go. When man ate the forbidden fruit and God put him outside of the garden. Death came upon him, disease, and death came. Unless he put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live forever. God put him outside of the garden and put cherubims out there with flickering swords, saying you can't come back in. 
Let's eat of the tree of life. Had Adam got back in that eight of the tree of life in the garden, we'd have lived forever in these cursed bodies. Amen. Think of living a million years in these old carcasses. We can't hardly stand them 80 and 90. Amen. The mind, friends, we had to move out of these bodies. Thank God he let death come upon man. So when these bodies, we can't stand them any longer. We can get out of them. Oh, my friends, what a blessing death is. Thank God for death. Amen. The most wonderful experience, ladies and gentlemen, outside of salvation of a Christian is death. Nothing more glorious, nothing more victorious, nothing more blessed. He said, Blessed are those that die in the Lord. Amen. Thank God for death. What a wonderful thing death is. What a marvelous thing death is. What if he was paralyzed, lying on the bed, eat up with bed sores, and had to lay there a million years and couldn't die and couldn't get no better? Here's somebody paralyzed and helpless, lying on the bed, eat up with bed sores, and they can't get no better? Here's somebody with cancer, eating them up, and they can't get well, and they can't die? What a marvelous thing it is when these houses get to where they're not fit to live in, we can die. Amen. Oh, thank God for death. Death is the greatest experience outside of salvation. Why? We have to move out of these bodies and go somewhere. When disease eats them up and fevers burn and pains record of the disease them, and we can't stand them any longer, we have to get out of them and go somewhere. We didn't have nowhere to go. We didn't have nowhere to go. Outside of the garden, fixing to die. Where would I? Was, where would we go? Float around in space. We have nowhere to go. Listen, Jesus. We're fixing to die. We're fixing to leave out of these bodies, no house to live in. Just here we are, out in space. Jesus said, "In my Father's house, Amen. there Amen. are many mansions." Amen. 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 And I'm going to go fix you a place if you believe in me and God. Amen. Yeah, right. And I'll come back and tell you to it and get ready. Where's Jesus going? He's going up to the Father's house to fix us somewhere to go when we have to move out of this car. Amen. 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 And he said, when I get it all fixed, I'll be back and carry you to it. My letter, he didn't have to. He had left all that space up there with the Father. But because of his interest in love and compassion for you and I, he saw us up against him. We couldn't stay in these old bodies always. He said, oh, in my father's house and many mansions. You say, Mr. Ray, you think there'll be enough room in heaven for all of them? Yes, sir. Amen. Without being crowded. If you're a mathematician, you'll figure from the description and revelation given of heaven, it's big enough to hold 12 and a half quintillion people. You know how many that is? If a billion people got saved every year for a for a hundred thousand years. If time was to last a hundred thousand years, it's only lasted two thousand, but time lasts a hundred thousand years, a billion get saved every year, that'd be only twelve quintillion. But if twelve and a half quintillion people get saved, there's enough room in heaven to make each one of us a house, ranch style, forty-six feet long, facing the street. Amen. No back alleys. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking about families, I'm talking about individuals. Amen. There's room in heaven right now to make 12 and a half quintillion people a house 46 feet long facing the main streets of the city. Amen. And if he run out of uh, space, how long would it take him to send an angel out with the measuring rod and take in a few more quintillion Amen. spaces? Amen. That's what he's up there for. That's what he went for, to prepare us a place. And he said, when I get him prepared, I'll be back. And he'll be back. Yeah. You can rest assured of that. A lot of modernists and liberalists and little smart elders running around saying Jesus isn't coming back. Don't pay no attention to their babble. Jesus said to what I saw, I would have told you. And you wait till he come back and tell you things so before you get shook up. This is some little dirty babble in his mouth. Amen. Some screwball. He made it and he'll make it good. Amen. So, my friends, he's gone to fix us a place 
He said, blessed are those that die in the Lord. Hey, this is not our permanent address. We're just pilgrims. Amen. Just passing through the enemy's territory. That's where he's getting so rough. Amen. But he's fixing us a permanent address, an eternal city. So my friends, that is the most blessed thing. The most blessed thing that can happen to you outside of salvation. That's the great thing. Because death would be a horrible thing without it. But once you get saved, the greatest experience that can happen to anybody is death. What is that? The D in death stands for deliverance. It delivers you from a diseased body. Delivers you from the demons and the death. Death delivers you from darkness. Death delivers you from disaster. Death delivers you from everything unpleasant. It delivers you, my friends, out of this old body that's eat up with disease, but the fever delivers you from the disease, from the pain, uh, from mental anxiety, from physical infirmity. Delivers! Death delivers! Amen. Delivers us out of this old carcass that's unpleasant to live in, into the pace prepared for us. And the E in death stands for exit. You know, you go in a public building and see a sign over the door, exit. That means in case the pressure gets too much or dangerizes, there's your way out. Amen. When the pressures, the fevers get too high and the pains get too severe, and we just can't uh, breathe and we can't suffer. There's an exit to the Into the paradise of God where we can breathe freely. Yes. And then the A stands for assurance. When you got delivered from this old body and the diseases and made your exit into the paradise of God, then you have the assurance that all God's promised you so. Amen. You have the assurance you've got some what Paul said. He said I know if this tabernacle be dissolved to have a building not made with hands eternal in the heaven. Amen. All the assurance you got somewhere to live won't be a drift and a float around. The assurance that you got a place to dwell in. And then the peace stands for triumphant. Triumphant victorious. Oh death where's your finger? Oh grave where's your victim? Delivers victorious over death in the graveyard and hell and demons and everything else. And the ancient death stands for home. We've gotten home after so long roaming. Amen. Home where well, we're not roaming anymore. Thank God for death. Oh, death is so wonderful. Death is so marvelous. Who wants to be horrified with death? Thank God for the joy and die. When you're saved. Amen. The greatest thing that ever happened to you is make your exit into the paradise of God. Leave all this physical infirmities and all these mental anxieties and social disorders behind. Jesus is going to fix it for us. And he's going to let us go. But he said, you carry on my business while I'm gone. Now Jesus established the church. And he gave you the keys. Not off the preacher. He gave the church the keys. Why, well, preachers die. Preachers move. Preachers do this. But the church stays here. Whether you have a preacher or not, you're going to look at him. Amen. He said, I'm working with you. I'm not coming to fix my business up there, but I'll give you the keys and you carry it on till I get back. So my friends, if you say, well, our deacons are not spiritual. What's wrong with your key? Amen. Our singers are not spiritual. What's the matter with your key? Amen. Our church is just not spiritual. What's the matter with your key? Our Sunday school teachers are not spiritual. What's wrong with your key? Amen. Now, if you know so much how it ought to be, why don't you use your key? Amen. 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 <laughs> Tell you a big problem, my brother and sister, is not in the nursery where we've got taken swollen babies. We got the wrong crowd in the nursery in Baptist churches. Amen. These little taken swimming swollen babies are not our problem. These old folks are all the time having to be burped all the time. Amen. Amen. Oh, I got hurt. I just can't get over it. Preacher don't run out and burp on that belly for the rest of their life. Amen. That yeah, is that his preacher spends his life burping belly aching church members when he wants to spend it winning people to Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh, my friends, we need to recognize God give us something to do besides belly ache and cry and murder. We've got a job to do. Amen. And if your church isn't what it ought to be, get on your proud knees and use your key and get what you need and shut up and burp it. Amen. 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 So beneath the sea. Too many of us, my friends, all the time are murmuring and yapping when you ought to be on your knees are praying, using your key. Amen. And then he said something else. He said, I'll build my church, I'll give you the keys, and I'll work with you. Whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind it in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose it in heaven. And my friends, that's what he does. When you bind things down here, he binds them up there, and when you loose them down here, you loose them up there. And then listen. 
And the 46th verse of the 24th chapter of Luke said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it who Christ has suffered to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all generations, beginning in Jerusalem. You witnesses of these things? What is it? Jesus is simply saying this. I've established my church. I'll give you the keys. And whatever you bind, I'll bind. And whatever you lose, I'll lose. And then he said, I've died and I was buried and I was rose again in order that you might have power to preach repentance and remission of sin. What is it? I've established my church to carry on my business while I'm gone. Give out the keys. Now that I've died and was buried and rose again in order that you can preach repentance and remission of sin. And you witnesses of these things, he said. And behold, I send the promises of my Father upon you, but tell you the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. You've got the church. You've got the keys. You've got the right to preach repentance and remission of sin. You're witnesses. All oh, this has done happen. You've seen it happen. You know it's so. you got all the promises of my Father backing up. But you carry the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. They worship him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continuing in the temple, praising and blessing God. And then over in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Keep in mind now the church has been established, you've been given the keys. Keep in mind that he's died and was buried and rose again, that you might preach repentance and remission of sin. And the promises of God are backing you up. But tell you in this. Guarantee to be a dude with power from on high, power to motivate with. All right. They were continuing in the temple praising and blessing God. Second chapter of the book of Acts, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Who? The church. They'd grown from 12 members to 120 now. And done lost one old Judas. But they got 120 members. On the day of Pentecost, they'd drawn from 12 to 120. They were there continuing in temple praising and blessing God. Now, a lot of people get the cart before the horse. They think the power that came on the day of Pentecost produced a revival as wrong as wrong can be. Amen. It did not produce a revival. They're having a revival. Amen. Said they were continuing in temple praising and blessing God day and night, wouldn't go home. And they all got in one accord in one mind. And hey, when you get a Baptist church wherever they ever won't go home. They just want to stay there and shout and praise God. That's what they're doing. They can praise the Lord day and night. And they wouldn't go home, wouldn't go nowhere else. There they were. And it's all in one accord. And one mind. And one spirit. And my friends, when you get a Baptist church in that shape, they've had a revival. Amen. Amen. Wasn't no bickering, but no division, wasn't no confusion, wasn't no madness. And nothing. They was all in one accord, one place, one mind. And what were they doing? They were there continuing. They wouldn't kick out and go nowhere for a day to miss them. And they said, they was having a revival meeting. Then the power came on them while they was having a meeting. And suddenly, when they got in that shape, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Whew! It sounded. And it filled one corner of the house where some of them were sitting. Oh, no, it didn't. It filled all of the house where the 120 members were. Amen. And there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon one, a good, one or two good old brothers and sisters. And then what the book said. There suddenly came a rushing in, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. Set up on every one of the 120 members. Not a one of them missed it. Forking tongues on them. Hell for our tongues, holy for our tongues. And there was one or two good old brothers and one good old sister that had been seeking the Holy Ghost, got filled with him. Not what the book said. They were A double A, all filled with the Holy Ghost. Not just one or two. They were one of the 120. Not a one of them escaped it. That's right. Amen. They all got filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. T-O-U-G-E-U-E-S. T-O-N-G-U-E-S. Tongues. Plural. No, not the unknown tongue, but tongues. Amen. Here's where your unknown tongue stopped and a known tongue took place. Amen. All right. 
They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit. As the Spirit. Notice, as the Spirit gave them utterance. They didn't have some fellow down over fucking shit talk, 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 talk. Amen. That's right. Like the tongues do. The Spirit got them. All right. As the Spirit gave them up to say spoke. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews. Devout men. What kind of men? Devout men. Not a bunch of hoodlums and hippies and hoppies and poppies. Devout men. Where were they from? Out of every nation under heaven. Hey, they were a single nation. They didn't have a representation. Amen. Amen. That's right. Now, how come on that? They were there by divine appointment. Amen. They were not there accidentally. They were there on purpose. God had so ordered that they were devout men, not a bunch of rebellious hoodlums, but devout men out of every nation under heaven was present on that day. Amen. You see that? Isn't it marvelous that God had so ordered the steps of men, devout men, respectable men, dependable men? Why? It's God's business and He don't want some rebellious hoodlum. Amen. He wants dependable men. Amen. Men, not women, men, he said. Amen. Well, from every nation, not just the full five of them, but every nation under heaven. They were there but divine appointment. How come? God had a purpose. Just like when he sent Jesus in the world to seek to save that which is lost, it's when God sent man sent in God whose name is John, John the Baptist, be the forerunner of Jesus. These men come to do something. What's the purpose? Here it is. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. There the divine appointment. What for? To get the message to the church. Now this will answer a problem that's been a problem with some of you. You ever hear people say, Well, it looked like God wouldn't be fat to send the heathen in hell never had a chance. You ever hear that? If you haven't, you're a little unusual. <laughs> Look, my God wouldn't send the heathen to hell who had never had a chance. This will shut your mouth. That's right. There was a representative crowd out of every nation under heaven. God held them there to hear the message, and they carried it back to every nation under heaven. And it isn't God's fault they didn't keep it. Amen. Amen. Every nation under heaven had it. Now, they didn't keep it. It ain't God's fault. You see, God never gets him me. He always picks it where nobody will point their finger in his face when it's over and say, God, we didn't have a chance. Amen. You see? For example, when most, I mean when Zacharias was to give, was announcing he's going to have a child, call him John the Baptist. Old Zacharias said, how do you know? How do I know rather that, that you're Gabriel telling me that? And Gabriel the angel said, I'll tell you how you know. You won't speak another word till the boy's born. You write his name down, John. Amen. And old Zachariah comes, mm -hmm. You ever say nothing else when that boy was born? They want to name him Zachariah. Mm -hmm. And they got him something. He wrote down his name is John. And then he could talk again. Amen. Right. And when Jesus was born, don't forget. God sent Gabriel to announce the birth of Jesus Christ. He didn't let Joseph or Mary or some king announce it. He sent Gabriel to announce it and with a band of angels backing him up and that's probably Michael with the warfaring angels going to whoop anybody up and deny it. Amen. My friends, I was some fool to jump on Gabriel and tell him he lied about that. I'd love to see what he'd do to him. Amen. Gabriel said he's the son of God born in the name of Judea and your pine and your swaddling clothes. God sent an angel to announce the birth of Jesus so nobody couldn't say as a frame up. Then when the veil was raised in the temple, how come it turned from the top to the bottom? So some fool couldn't say something like that scared and run to it. Poor holy. Amen. God fool through everything ever did do. Amen. Ever will do. He said these men out of every nation under heaven, my friends, so that everybody would know about Jesus. And furthermore than that, if you just want to be contentious, I'll tell you something else. Over the book of John, the first chapter, ninth verse, God sealed that up again. John, the first chapter of the ninth verse, listen to it. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man that's ever come in this world had enough light to be saved. And then he said in the third chapter of the book of 
First chapter of the book of Romans, he said, because of the manifestation of the eternal Godhead in creation, there'll be a lot of excuse in that day. What? The manifestation of the eternal Godhead. There'll be a lot of excuse about put three joints in your fingers, three joints in your limbs, three parts of your body, flesh, blood, and bone, three parts of your brain, three parts of your eye, three parts to the tree, heart, sap, and bark, three parts to the creation, mineral life, plant life. Everything God ever created is in three pieces. Declaring God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and there's an open nature that said ever so to hell and ever live if they won't see Jesus. Amen. What you're saying, preacher? I'm saying it's one simple truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and you can't change it. Amen. And here it is. And there they were. When it was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They all were all amazed and marveled. What confounded them? What amazed them? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Amen. You get that? Heard them speak in his own. Every man, out of Revelation, heard them speak in his own language. Seven verse. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans one nationality? How here we have a man in our own tongue wherein we were born. What they said? Here's all of these church members, Galileans, one nation after, and yet they're speaking our, our own language fluently. The mother tongue language. Not just the language of that nation. See, they might not have understood the national, but God saw to it that they spoke it in the mother tongue language. So nobody can stand in the church and say, Yeah, God, I know they have heard that church. But I didn't understand what they're saying. I didn't know whether they're cussing or praying. No, they understood every word. Amen. Every word. You hear me, my brother, sister. You know where this unknown tongue business started? Tower of Babel. That's right. Amen. Once folks said, We're going to build some other way to heaven. They started building tower, going to build up so high they'd step up in heaven. Step off that tower, step over to him. Some other way other than Jesus' way. Amen. And he touched their tongues, they went to chatting like a bunch of geese and couldn't get around. That's right. Amen. You have this preacher. I'm not being mean. I'm preaching the truth this morning. Amen. Where are you find tongue talkers? You find them preaching some other way other than Jesus Christ. Amen. They say you got to talk tongues to get to heaven. You got to live a sin to get to heaven. Every bit of it's a lie. Amen. Amen. No wonder God lets them talk tongues so forth for here that damnable heresies. Amen. Jesus sat here and I witness. And hey, if you don't understand what a witness is saying, he's not a witness. That's right, amen. amen. And anybody gets up and jabbing and a-bobbing and you don't know what to say, Paul said, if they don't understand you, shut up and sit down. Amen. Now, I want you to know, God never does nothing unknown. What God does is known. Amen. Right. Keep that in mind. Now I want you to know, God never does nothing unknown. What God does is known. Amen. Keep that in mind. What's the need of God having a bunch of fun, stuff pulled when folks don't know what's going on? That's right. I don't need to buy any money. If God's doing anything, it's for the benefit of somebody else. And he wants you to know what's being said and what's going on. Amen. You hear me? I'm not being mean, I'm just telling the truth. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. They shocked somebody. But you dig into the doctrines. Brother, when God has something done, give my witnesses. Folks will know what to say. Amen. You, if you're a jury, we brought a witness opinion. You didn't understand his language. We couldn't hold the jury responsible. But if you understood what he said, then you'd have to make a decision. Amen. So that's what I'm saying. They heard him in their own tongue. In their own mother language, they heard him. And you want this to say. Why? Because when the final day comes to the judgment, nobody can point the finger at God and say, I didn't know what they were saying that day. Yes, they did. They heard it in their own mother tongue language. Then they all marveled. They were amazed. They were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? All of these speaking Galileans, and yet they're speaking this other language. Others more can say, these fellows are full of new wine. Peter stood up and said, didn't so. It's just nine o'clock in the morning. He hadn't had time to get on a drunk yet. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What did Joel say? It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I'll pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. So my friends, what's he said? In the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. Sons and daughters, old men, young men, ignorant men, servants, maids, and everyone else. What does it mean? Here's what it means. Up until this hour, the Holy Ghost came upon the people when they needed them. He went back. Because Jesus is here. But Jesus said, when I go away, he had come to stay. Amen. Jesus came in bodily form, remained in bodily form, left in bodily form, returned in bodily form. But when the Holy Ghost came, he had no body, so he took up his abode in our bodies. Holy Ghost is not in heaven. Holy Ghost is not floating around in space. He's in the same people today. Amen. He's dwelling in your hearts and in your life. Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost and that He dwelleth in you? Amen. Amen. You don't have to go out seeking Him. He's in there. You say, preacher, okay, I know. I'm not going to preach about the book. I got that a sense in that. I'm not getting near Him. Amen. You'll cut you out with the Word. Amen. 37 verse of the 7th chapter of John. The last day that great day of the feast, Jesus stood crying, saying, Men and thirst, let him come and drink. He that believeth on me, the scripture said, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What's he said? Jesus said, When I go away, I'll send the Holy Ghost, and he'll stay instead of me. Amen. And when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross, Watch it closer now. When the tabernacle was finished, the Shekinah glory came until they couldn't see Moses for seeing God. Amen. When the temple, Solomon's temple, was finished and dedicated, what happened? The Shekinah glory filled the temple till they couldn't see Solomon and man for seeing God. All right, listen to Jesus. I will build my church here and die on the cross. It is finished. Well, what was he doing? Being on the church. It's finished. And when he said that, the Shekinah glory came on till they couldn't see men for seeing God. And that's the way it ought to be now. My friends, I call your attention to another passage of Scripture that you need to recognize in the Word of God that... uh, when the Spirit of God gets upon us, and we get right with God, there's some things that we need to recognize and see that God tells us. Listen to this. 12th verse of the 16th chapter of John. I get many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he guides you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father mine, therefore say I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. What did he say? When the Holy Ghost comes, he won't speak of himself, he'll speak of Jesus. Amen. And when you hear people running around saying, oh, I got the Holy Ghost. I'm passed out devils, I can heal folks, I got the Holy Ghost. That don't fool the thing. Amen. I've seen a whole steam little healer man one day, been paralyzed 12 years. Run out of stairs back, jumped up front. <laughs> Had been paralyzed since. <laughs> now, don't you realize, my friends, Jesus said in the book of John, the 16th chapter, when the Holy Ghost comes, He'll not refer to Himself, He'll refer to me. Amen. And when you hear folks say, Oh, I've got four of those eyes before there, I can't tell you I can heal folks, preach right now, and they look at me, and they'll say, He said, My friends, they've got a ghost put it in the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 That's right. You get full of whole you won't do one thing. And that's break on Jesus. Amen. That's all. You go to break it on the gifts and the Holy Ghost. You ain't never been filled with the whole spirit. You just got an experience of some sort. Amen. You got your ghost all right. He'll run you in the thicket for trouble. Now then listen. He said he'll pour out his spirit upon all the flesh. Sons and daughters, young men, old men, old men. Servants and maids. Poor, rich, and touch and What? When you're saved, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. And if you let him, he'll praise the Lord through you. Amen. What is it? He will fill them all 
And they went from house to house. After he got full of the Holy Spirit, this church went from house to house to house. What are you doing? Praise on the Lord. Amen. Not the Holy Ghost, but praise on the Lord. That's what the book said, ladies and gentlemen. Went from house to house, praise on the Lord. So when we get full of the Spirit of God, we'll do one thing. We'll go through the community praising the Lord. Amen. Not breaking on who we are, what we've got. We'll just go out praising the Lord. Amen. He said they shall prophesy. What is prophesying? Good news. Good news. Jesus saying, sit it across the way. Jesus saying, give it to the The rich and the young, the old. Everybody, Jesus saying, Jesus saying. When you get full of the God, one thing, Jesus saying, Jesus saying, and Jesus saying. And that does it. Amen. Amen. Aren't that good? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Go home and sleep this evening. And the book of Acts, the second chapter. In the 47th verse. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I want us to think along that line tonight. I talked to you this morning about why Jesus established his church and set his church in action while he was here. Now then, tonight I want to pick up there and go on a little further with it. Why did God add you to the church is the question I want to raise tonight. And the Lord added to the church daily such as the saved. I want to ask you the personal question tonight. Why did God add you to this church? You say, well, the Lord didn't add me. I just joined it. Then you're in the wrong pew. Amen. In the wrong position. The wrong place. In the wrong stall. My friends, Jesus said he added to the church daily such as a saved. Now, he had a purpose in adding you to this particular church. Have you ever really faced it? Have you ever really confronted the fact that the Lord had a special purpose for adding you to this church? If I'd called you by name and asked you personally, why did God add you to this church tonight? Could you tell me? Why did he add you? You say, well, preacher, I don't know. Isn't that a tragedy? You know, it's awful to belong to church for 10 or 15 years and never know why God added you to it. Now, he wasn't just adding to get figures. He's not in the figure business. God wants quality, not quantity. Amen. We got a lot of Baptist churches, and God forbid, I don't want to be critical, but we got a lot of Baptist churches today doing nothing but counting noses. Amen. They're trying to have more than everybody else has. And they're running through the baptistry like we used to run cows through the dipping bats and get the ticks off of them. And I'm thinking now of one church, particularly Baptist church, that boasted about they baptized 4,500 last year. They got less than 1,600 in Sunday school right now. What went with you, 4,500? And so, my friends, God's never been interested in quantity. He wants quality. You see that in the case of Gideon. Gideon called out an army and his 32,000 answered the call, and God said, There's a lot of them, not even ministered. Tell the ones that don't mean business, go on back home. And 22,000 of them went back. He said, you still got too many. You still got too many folks in there. Take them down to the river where there's water. The ones that dip up the water and lap it out of their hands while they look to see if they can see an enemy. Select them. But the ones that get up and down and lap it up like a dog lap now, send them back too. When Gideon got through, he just had 300 left out of 32,000. But he took the 300 and won the victory over the, the enemy. My friends all down through. The word, we find one thing prevailing, and that is that God's not interested in quantity, but quality. Amen. You notice Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. God's not planning on giving his kingdom to the whole multitude of people. Right. He's planning on turning his kingdom over to that little faithful few that's been found faithful down through the years. Amen. Notice here he said, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. And so, my friends, this is God's proven ground to see whether you're fit to be a king or to be a ruler. If you're not going to be faithful to his church, then he's not going to let you be a ruler in the next world. Amen. And so we need to recognize that as we look at it, my friends, here's the whole business. And God had a particular reason for adding you to this church. God never does nothing just to be figuring. 
be diddling with a pencil or something to add numbers up. God had a purpose in adding you to this church. And you need to know what that purpose is and then accomplish the purpose for which God added you to this church. And I want you to realize tonight that's a very vital thing in the eyes of God. God had started his church and added them to the church and said, Occupy till I come. Now the thing I want us to realize, first of all, my friends, is simply this, that God didn't add you to this church to do somebody else's job. Amen. Everybody has a specific task in this church. God never runs a duplicating machine. Every individual, in other words, is somebody in God's sight. I want you to realize one thing tonight. You're not an accident in the world. You are here for a specific purpose. Amen. God brought you in the world to do one thing. There was a man sent from God whose name was John to prepare a people for the Lord. God brought you in the world, ladies and gentlemen, for just one thing. You're not an accident. God let you breathe and be born in this world and created you. Because he had a specific job to do. And he created you with the ability to do it. Notice that in that verse that I read to you in the 25th chapter of Matthew, for example. You get these words. Matthew 25, 15. Every man according to his several ability. God created us all with a certain amount of ability. One of these others had five talent ability. One of them had two talent ability. And one of them had one. Now the man that had five talents doubled his and had ten. One that had two doubled his and had two, four. And he did just as much as the one that had five talents because all he did was double it. Amen. So did the other man with two double his and had the one with one talent double his. He had done just as much as the fellow with five talents. Amen. In other words, my friends, God's got it on that basis and on that order. If a little boy that's just made a dime this week brings his pen and puts his five in, some bigger boy has made a dollar and puts his dime in. Some man's made ten dollars and puts a dollar in. Another man's made a thousand dollars and puts a hundred dollars in as his tithe. He didn't put in a bit more than that little fella put in a penny. Because all he put in was a tithe and the little boy put in a tithe. The sight of God, one did just as much as the other. One was just as faithful as the other. The boy was faithful over his tithe, which was a penny. The man was faithful over his tithe, which is a hundred dollars. But that's all. And so, my friends, but this one man that had one talent went out and hid it and didn't invest it. And God came and he was disappointed in it. And as a result of the one that invested the five, he said, You know, thou end of the joy of thy Lord, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make the ruler over many things. Said the same thing to the second man who'd invested the two and doubled his. But to the man who didn't invest anything because he just had one talent, then he said, Take it away from him and give it to somebody to invest it and use it. And what I want you to realize, my friends, if you're not going to do what God created you to do and brought you in the world to do, then why let you breathe? Amen. He come to the fig tree and found no figs on it, and he cursed the fig tree and it withered away real soon. I think we've got a lot of Baptists withered tonight because God's come and found nothing in their lives. He planted them here to bear fruit and they bear none and they're withered tonight because of it. I want you to realize everybody is... As an individual with God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Isaiah, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham. See, God deals with us as individuals. God never runs a duplicate machine. He never duplicates. My beloved, every drop of rain that comes down, comes down as an individual drop. If it is all one big drop, it's flesh just to death when it hit us. But every drop of rain leads up there and comes down and not one drop gets mixed up with another drop. God so times the drops and so places the drops that none of them have a collision with each other. But whenever a drop of rain gets placed where God sent it from the sky, the earth is wet. Amen. Amen. Then you get out and watch it snow sometimes. And you ever flake of snow comes as an individual flake. You see a great big flake, big around, it's half a dollar and it's coming down that little flake, big as a nail head. You think that big old flake's going to hit that little flake, but it won't, it'll bypass it. Flakes of snow never touch each other till they touch the ground. But when God gets all the big flakes and the little flakes down, the ground is blanketed with snow. Amen. Well, it took the little flakes as well as the big flakes. It took the little, takes the individual drops, my friends, to empty the earth and takes the individual flakes to blanket the earth with snow. And so as a result, God has created you with an ability and you've got a place to play in this life that nobody else can ever play. Amen. And if you don't play that part, it'll never be played, but you'll face God with it. Amen. Amen. We're created in Christ Jesus. He tells in the book of 
Ephesians, the second chapter, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God created you to do a certain job. Amen. He brought you in the world for that purpose. You're not an accident here. My friends, then every individual is a different individual. Therefore, you must venture to God as an individual. You can get a million people together, and you can't find two human beings exactly alike. You can get two million people and pull them together, but you won't find any two human beings exactly. You can pull a thousand leaves off a tree, and there's no two leaves exactly alike. You can pluck a thousand blades of grass, and you won't find no two blades of grass identical. God never repeats. Every leaf plays its part, every blade of grass plays its part. My friends, every human being plays its part, every drop of rain plays its part, every flake of snow plays its part, and nobody else can take its place. And God put you in this world for a special purpose, and if you don't serve that purpose out, then the purpose for which God put you here is defeated. Amen. You'll have to face God with it after a while. Now we stop to recognize, for example, my friends, we have different talents. Thank God I don't have to answer to the talent of somebody else. You take, for example, there's some great preachers in this country like Billy Graham, who's multiplied thousands of people come to hear him preach. He's popular all over the world and on all over the world. He's the great evangelist of the day. But my friends, he has more talent than I have. God didn't hold me responsible for not preaching as many people as Billy Graham preaches because he didn't create me with that ability. And my friends, there's W.A. Christian, which is the pastor of the largest Baptist church among Southern Baptists. Now there in Dallas, Texas, probably the largest Baptist church in the world. But my friends, he has the ability. And you put some little peanut preacher like me out there in that big first church in Dallas, I wouldn't last till the water got hot. He's got over 16,000 members. And he's highly organized. He's got 280 deacons. That's more members than we got. And he's got his Sunday school highly organized. You can't even let one of you, if you want to take your baby to church in Sunday school out there, if it isn't big enough to hold a tithe and envelope, you have to pin the tithe and envelope on its back before you can get in. He means for everybody to tithe, the young ones and all. And he gets by with it. Some of your churches did that, you'd get thrown out before you got started. But what I'm saying, you have the ability. You put me or Ron and Simpson in that first church and we'd go crazy in a little while. But you turn around to put it. There'd be a crystal in a little church like this or like I was out at Myrtle. And he wouldn't last a week. He'd climb the walls because he didn't have no more to preach to than that. You see, God created other fellows with what ability needed. God didn't give you somebody else's ability. He gave you your ability. And God, thank God, he don't expect me to have any more, do any more than my ability allows me to do. For example, down in Mississippi where I live, we have big tractors now and plow 12 rows at a time. Got 12 plows behind them. They go down through those big level fields out there in the Mississippi Delta. You plow 12 rows at a time. And pick four rows of cotton at a time in those cotton picking machines. It's a marvelous machine. But there they are. Here they go down through those fields plowing 12 rows of corn or 12 rows of beans or 12 rows of cotton at one time. And they, they can cover several hundred acres in a day's time with those big plows and, and big tractors. But when they get to the end of the row, they can't. And then all the corners, they can't plow with that track. It takes too much room to turn it around. So there's a lot of corners. They have to get a small tractor or new to plow those corners. Amen. And they usually plant their seed crop, their special seed crop in those corners because they're treated delicate with a mule or with a little tractor. And the best seed comes out of those corners. That's usually the richest, most fertile soils in the corners where the big tractors can't get in. And so as a result, they have some little tractors or a mule and get in the corners and plow the corners out. But a lot of the seed corn and seed cotton comes out of those corners. And so, my friends, we've got great men like Billy Sunday used to be and like Charles Haddon Spudgeon used to be and like Billy Graham and others. They're the big ones with the 12 plows behind them, and they take great throngs of people as they go. But God's got a lot of little fence corners yeah. there that he's plowed out. They call fellows like Ronnie Simpson and myself and some others for plow the fence corners. Yeah. But those corners are just as important, if you please, as the big middle field. Yeah. Because out of those corners, churches like yours have come some of the great preachers of yesterday and of today. 
They've come out of places like that, and God wants everybody with different talents to do, do the different tasks that there is to do. So as a result, he's planted you in the church. Hey, if there's some other church better for you to be in, God had added you to it. Amen. He knows what he won't do in this church. You want to find out if you don't know. Don't spend your life for 10 or 15 years. Listen. Preacher, I don't know why God had me in church. Get on your knees and stay with God till he tells you. That's yeah. it. It's dangerous not to do what God created us to do. For example, my friends, God created Cain to show forth a marvelous thing. That was the shedding of the blood, the blood of the innocent blood of an animal, the blood that was sinless, guiltless blood, if you please, was to be sprinkled. And old Cain broke the works of his own hands and said, I'll do it this way, God. God said, no, Cain. He told him the second time, no, I want it this way. And Cain, as a result, wouldn't listen to God and went ahead and did it his way. And God put a, made Cain an outcast and made him the fugitive and a vagabond and put a curse upon him because he wouldn't do what God brought him in the world to do. There was Esau. God meant for Esau to respect the birthhood and the, the birthright of the priesthood of Christ. And old Esau went out and stole the birthright of the priesthood of Christ for a mess of pottage. And as a result, he didn't do what God brought him in the world to do. And you find Esau spending the rest of his life on his knees, crawling around with bitter tears, trying to find a place of repentance, but he never did find it. Why? He didn't do what God put him here to do, and God left him. Cain didn't do what God put him here to do, and God left him. Saul didn't do what God sent him out to do, and God withdrew from him, turned the wicked spirit on him, he suicided to get out of the mess he got himself in. And I can tell you others. My friends, there's a lot of Baptists tonight all mixed up and all word and all miserable because they haven't done what God had in the church to do. Amen. They're in miserable shape. And I tell you, you better find out why God added you to this church and get to doing it. Amen. Abraham was the only one God ever called on to offer his only son. To show forth the offering of his only son, Jesus Christ, as God came for that. Moses is the only one that ever saw a burning bush. Nobody else has ever seen one like Moses saw. Daniel's the only one that ever survived the lion's den. And the lions couldn't eat him because he's so full of God and the angels fished it with him. Amen. My friends, I want you to realize every individual is a different thing. We never had but one Pentecost. My friends, people have prayed for it through every generation. It's never been but one, never will be but that one. God isn't running no repeating duplicate machine. But you know, when the children of Israel, God fed them each day with a man, and when they've gathered up enough for the second day, it molded and milled it on. And I want you to realize tonight, my friends, God isn't going to let you duplicate something and do something. He's going to have you to do it like he wants to do it, or you won't do it, that's all. Amen. Amen. And so we stop to recognize we must realize that we're saved as people and add to the church for a special work. God had something for you to do. And he saved you. He added you to the church to do it. And you ought to find out what it is and do it. Amen. We stop to recognize these that have failed to do what God had them to, to do has always come up cursed and blinded as a result of it. He made us without nature. He gave us without ability. We are vessels in the sight of God. You're an important vessel in God's sight. One day I came by and they was bidding off some, auctioning off some little, just little old red clay stone pots, fire pots. Used to buy them 10 cents a piece all day long. They auction it up, auction it off, and there somebody bid thousand dollars, somebody fifteen hundred, somebody two thousand, somebody twenty five, somebody three thousand, somebody thirty five hundred. Then finally forty five hundred, and I thought, well, you crazy folks, you can buy them old pots anywhere. And finally it went at forty seven fifty. The auctioneer cried out forty seven fifty, forty seven fifty once, forty seven fifty twice, and this person's bought it. And I thought, well, stupid thing, I can get your truck load of them for less than me. But when they found, when I found out what it was, they had a $5,000 diamond in that pot. It was the diamond that made that pot valuable. It wasn't nothing to the old clay pot. It was what is in it. My friends, your old carcass isn't worth anything. It's what God put in you that's valuable. It makes it important that you find out what God's got in you to give out to the world. And we need to realize that he added us to the church, first of all, to identify us. Come ye out from the moment. Be separated. My brother, sister, I want you to realize one thing before God tonight. God adds you to the church and so it would identify you. Separate you from the multitudes and the crowds. Amen. 
He picked you out. He designated you. For example, let me illustrate what I'm trying to say. A little boy came home. He's all upset because he found out he's an adopted child. He never knew it. He's a screaming and a crying and wringing his hands. And they made fun of him at school. And he said, I'm never going back to school. His mother couldn't get him to go back. She called his father. And he come home. He's a big businessman. And while they were there, he said, well, well, what's the matter, my son? He said, I found out you're not my real daddy. And I don't know who my real daddy is. And this is not my real mother. And I don't know who she is. I don't want to live. I don't want to die. But the wise foster parent came and said, Son, let me tell you something. Me and your mother here couldn't have a child of our own. We wanted one. We put in for adoption. So we went down to the adoption center. And there's 76 babies down there. We wanted a child that had our state when we were gone. They let us go by and nurse each one of those children. We took them in our arms and loved them. All 76 of them, and each time we picked you up and hugged you and loved you, there's something about you that responded to us. We picked you. Son, we could have picked either one of the other 75 that have done that and left you. You go back to school when they get to ripping you and throwing off on you. Lift up your chin and throw out your chest and say, That's true. But my mom and daddy picked me. I'm a pick baby. I'm a chosen baby. My mom and daddy had to take whatever they got. I got picked out. Amen. My friends, that's it. Don't ever apologize for being a Christian. The Lord came along. I never have understood it. You don't either. Somewhere or another, when he loved you, there was a response in you to him that made him love you and he chose you. He picked you. I don't know why. But think of the million multitude that's gone on to hell tonight. Think of the great calm that's marching towards hell tonight. He could have left you in that crowd. That's right. You could be going to hell tonight yeah. with a million multitude. But somehow or another, when he put his love about you, you responded. Amen. And he picked you. You're God's chosen. You're God's picked out. Don't apologize. Lift your chair yeah. and say, yes, I'm one of God's chosen. I'm going to apologize in that car. Then, my friends, another thing, the Lord added to the church daily such as a saint. You know what that means? I'll tell you exactly what it means, my friends. He picked you. You are chosen. You keep this one thing in mind. God saw that it wasn't good for man to be alone. He put him to sleep and from his side. He took a rib and created a woman, gave him a companion and a happening. The only begotten Son of God came in this world and he was alone. And his side was riveted and out of that side came blood and water. Blood to cleanse and blood to give life. And water to make his wife. God said it wasn't good for his son to be alone. So he gave him companion. And the companion is the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And so as a result, my friends, you are the bride of Christ. If God adds you to this church, then you're the bride of Christ. You hear me, my friends? When you men got ready to get mad, you just didn't run out in a bunch of women with your eyes shut and grab you a woman with a hair and head and drag her in and say, come on, you're going to be my wife. Yeah, if you did, you got in a mess by now. Yeah, it made a difference with you as to who your wife was. You married somebody you felt like would understand you and love you and respond to you and work with you. Now then the church is the bride of Christ. He just didn't run out and grab everybody and bring them to himself. But there was something about you that he loved. Something about you that he felt like you would respond to him. And mother his kingdom. And he chose you. He said, come and live with me. Just like you took a wife and she left her family and left her boyfriends and left her girlfriends and has come to live with you. Amen. To mother your children. And like man of Jesus called you out from your loved ones and all your friends and everybody else and said, come and live with me. Amen. Be my bride and mother the children that I birthed into the world. Amen. Oh, beloved, I want you to realize tonight that the church is the bride of Christ and he added you to him because he needed a companion, somebody to comfort him, somebody to work with him, somebody to mother his children, somebody to take care of his kingdom. And he picked you out. And you're responsible to him tonight. 
Just as much as a woman is responsible for being a companion to her husband and mother and the children and loving the husband and working with the husband and helping the husband just that sure you're that responsible to Jesus Christ tonight to mother those and he's born into the family of God and to comfort and to be a companion to him and to help him and to honor him and to live with him and to travail and so forth and so on for his kingdom. Amen. I want you to realize you have a responsibility. You are not an accident in the church. The Lord added you. The Lord reached out and got a hold Amen. of you and pulled you in and added you to the church because there's something about you he needed. Amen. And you ought to find out what it was. God have mercy on you if you go through life and never know why God added you to the church. Now you better find out why God wants you in his church and add you to it. And you get out and get to run around with the worldly crowd desecrating God's day, then you're committing spiritual adultery. Amen. Just like if you get out, you may even run around with some other man. Don't prove true to your husband. You're called an adulteress. You're living in adultery. In like manner, you men and you women, boys and girls, who go out from the Christ and don't live close to Christ and live with Christ and honor Christ for your life, you all the time run around with the whirlings and desecrating God's name every one of them. You're committing spiritual adultery. Amen. You'll have to face God with that thing. God didn't add you to be a whirling. He added you to be his companion, Amen. to be his bride, to be his wife. And I want you to recognize that thing holds now and forever. Amen. For example, my friends, in the book of Revelation, the 19th chapter, when Jesus comes, then he said, Blessed are those that's invited to the wedding supper. That means every saved person in this world will go to the wedding supper. Amen. But hey, they won't all be the bride. Amen. He said, Blessed are those invited to the wedding supper. The bride and groom don't have to be invited. It's their supper. Amen. Ronnie's got some little girls, and if the time goes on long enough, things are they'll fall in love with some boy and madam. And Mrs. Simpson and Ronnie will go to the wedding and they'll go to the reception. But the old boy that marries that girl sure won't marry Ronnie and Mrs. Simpson. Amen. The rest of the family will be at the wedding. They'll be at the wedding supper and the reception and all of that. But he was there. Yeah, he'll take the little girl. Now, fellas, if you see a young girl fascinating, it's just the little reason. They're all fascinating, it's just the little fellas. If he is, now I mean, there's no business to this guy that he loves you, fellas. See, after all, that of those, that they're talking to you, if there's not still all of them, they're found. Yeah, but if you don't look at all like them. I don't understand it. You can't help but understand it. Somebody that's been a part of the church and prayed for it and paid the expenses of it and been present, suffered persecution and all of that, then say that they'll be the same thing. Bread and supper's the ones that never took the responsibility of the church. You'll never make his fault, put you believe it. Amen. Amen. Those of us that have been persecuted and laughed at and prayed and paid and been present and carried on the church, my friends, we're the ones that'll be the bride at the bridegroom supper. The rest of the folks will be there and attend it and be blessed by it, but not be loud in person. Amen. The Lord added you to his church that he might honor you, that you might be his companion through life and through eternity. What an honor. What a privilege. Keep this in mind. There's many multitudes traveling through the world. My friends, it's not a part of the bride tonight. You ought to thank God that he chose you and picked you out to be one. And this church come out from the monarch. Put on the whole armor of God. Now that he picked you out so you could be soldiers of the cross. God wants his army designated. You go down here and join the new enlistings place and enlist in the army of the United States government. They run you through all kinds of severe tests. If you are physically all right and mentally all right, you're loyal to the country. They'll finally swear you in. You signed your life away to go in the army and be a soldier in Uncle Sam's army. When all the signatures are gathered in a certain day set up, you come out there and they give you the army uniform and you put it on. You say, now look at here. I don't want that old army uniform on. I don't like that. Ooh, I can't stomach that mess. I got a nice suit post, tailor made. Let me soldier with it and I'll go to the front lines. I'll shed my blood. I'll give my life. I'll die for America, but I am not about to wear old khaki. Amen. You're aware you old soldier. Amen. Why? He identifies you from everybody else. Amen. You have to be identified to be in the army. Amen. 
If you don't put on the uniform of the nation and identify you and designate you, you can't soldier. You can be an American citizen. You can be an American. But if you're going to soldier, you have to wear the uniform. Oh, but I want to soldier so bad, but I can't. Oh, I tell you, I tell you, just stick a piece of tacky on my head. Let me wear my suit. Oh, Amen. soldier. Amen. Everybody know about that? No, no. No, no, you won't. You're going to be put on the whole uniform and not soldier. Amen. Amen. Now, this little sprinkling form on the head ain't going to get you. Amen. Amen. You're going to put on a whole uniform of baptism, which declares your death to the world and death to sin and resurrected to live a new life and declares the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you're not willing to put that on, you can't soldier for Jesus. Amen. He adds you to the church to identify you, to put on the uniform that declares you one of the soldiers of the cross and the soldiers of God's army. Amen. That's why he adds you to the church to identify you as the bride of Christ, as a soldier of God. And then, my friends, he did something else. He added you to the church to give you a place in action. Christ set the church in action to carry on his business.